I have a prayer request from my daughter, it's Jamie. Jamie's daughter, my granddaughter, plays volleyball. She plays club ball. And uh, evidently they had a tournament today. And uh, Jamie texted me. She said, this is an urgent prayer request this evening about after church. I need you to pray for some volleyball girls. This is not my granddaughter's team. The name of the team is Three Crosses. Evidently they're from Texas. One of the girls passed away in an accident on Saturday. I think the girls are okay right now as they are playing this tournament, but I know as they drive home tonight across Texas, it's going to hit them hard. They will probably be leaving Midland around 6, and it's about a five-hour drive. So she asked that we pray for them, and we will do that. So uh, if you don't mind, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we get ready to start. Father, Lord, we lift up this team to you and the coach and those who will be traveling with this team. We pray, Father, you give them wisdom and the encouragement that they need, the comfort that they need as they go through this process. We pray for this little girl's family and the loss that they have and that you might be with them tonight as well. Lord, thank you that we as a church family, as a family of God, we can come together and pray and know, God, that you're involved and you care about these situations. And we just pray, Father, again, that you might meet the needs that they will need tonight. Bless us as we're here now. Bless our time of Bible study. May we, Father, find ourselves in this passage tonight and um, let you do what you need to do to make us who we need to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Ruth chapter 2, if you would. I want to do something kind of fun to get started, if I can. We have the most unlikely duo that now is back in Bethlehem, Naomi and Ruth. What makes this an unusual duo is one is older and one is younger. Both of them are widows. One is, from, is a Jewish and the other is a Moabite. And uh, it's interesting when you think about these two traveling together, and what the appearance must have looked like, you know. But I want to ask you tonight, will you do me a favor? And here's what I want you to do. I want you to, just for a minute, I want you to put yourself in their position. I want you to imagine that you're Naomi for a second, and you're traveling home, you've lost everything. What are some of the feelings that you have? What are some of the anticipations? What are some of the anxious things that might be going through your head as you approach Bethlehem? You have to talk loud because I can't hear you. What? Yeah, if the family's going to even accept her back, she could be concerned about that. What else? Huh? What will be left of her home? Yeah. Will they know her? Yeah, because she's been gone a while and she's changed. What else? Huh? Will they accept her? Yeah. Yep, she's glad to be going home because she knows that God's working back in Israel, but at the same time, she's got all these anxious feelings. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah, you know that would be pretty, yeah, there would be a lot of anxious moments as they travel. But the, she made it back, and uh, in fact, we read in uh, chapter 1, verse 20, and she, they, had, they said, is this Naomi? And she said to them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call you me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi is in a bitter spirit. She's, she's got problems. And she doesn't know how she's going to live. She doesn't know how she's going to support herself. And she's got this Moabite girl with her. How are people going to receive that? And that's her daughter-in-law. She can't just throw her out, nor does she want to. She needs her. And uh, what are they going to say? You know, they, Moabites are not received in Israel. They, that's not a good thing. And uh, there's, there's a lot going on, even unsaid things, I think. Well, let's think for a second about Ruth. What's her anxious moments? What's she thinking? I just gave you one. Will they receive her? I mean, what, how will they receive me knowing that I'm a Moabite? She can't hide. You know, she's, 
she's ethnically, she's, she's exposed. She's a darker color. And uh, so she's, she, they, she's very noticeable who she is. Huh? Fearful. fearful. Yeah, definitely fearful. How's she going to take care of Naomi? That's her job. That's what she's going back for is to take care of Naomi, you know. How's she going to do that if, if they don't receive her? How's she going to do, well, how's she going to find a job? How's she going to provide for Naomi? All of that's got to be in her head. Be my God. And that's all new to her, though. You think about, that's like a new Christian, you know. Is God going to really do all the things he said he would do? I mean, is he going to be there for me? Am I going to be one of them now? Am I going to be accepted in the Jewish faith? Am I going to, I mean, she's got a lot of things to concern, but you're right. Yeah, and, uh, but she's, and you're right, though. She, tell, she told Naomi, your God will be my God. So there's a, there is a transfer of trust there that she's had. Anthony? Yep. Yep. I'm very courageous. I admire Ruth. I admire her. You have to admire her because she she really stepped into a, 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 a awkward situation. Think about it, if you move to a foreign country by yourself or as a as a widow like she was and you don't know what what kind of health plan do they have i mean are you going to be able to get any help uh, who are you going to go to where are you going to live what's it going to be like uh for her it's a whole new realm she grew up in moab now she's going to bethlehem where they worship a different god they worship differently than they did she's got to learn all that there's a lot man you have to admire ruth for th that uh, commitment and uh so here we have this duo, two widows, one older, one younger, no means of support, both of them poor, one's a stranger in the country. Verse 22 of verse two, chapter 1 says, So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. Probably the great thing was they came at the right time, the barley harvest. Now, Naomi would have known, possibly, I'm sure she would have known, that there was a kind of welfare system set up to take care of widows and the poor, the needy. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. I wrote, we must admire Ruth for taking on the role of the caregiver for Naomi. That's a big deal when you think about Naomi doing that. Again, leaving her home, leaving her family to go be a caregiver to uh, Naomi in a foreign country. You know, being a caregiver is not, most of us, I think, are, if you haven't yet, you will. Uh, it's not as glamorous as some people make it sound. It, it, is, it is a lot of work, and it's stressful. You've got somebody in your home, and, you're, and they're counting on you to take care of them. They're counting on you to provide. They're counting on you to be there. And it's a, it's a tough call. But she's taking that on. This is a foreigner coming as a poor widow, no visible uh, ability to care for herself. And Naomi, a bitter, needy, elderly widow with no one other than this poor little girl to take care of her. It's a pitiful sight if you want to know the truth. It's pitiful. It's one of those things as a church, as a pastor, they come and they tell you their story. And you go, what can I do? I mean, how can I help? That's, you know, you. You're, you're so far down in the hole, there's nothing I can do that was going to, going to, and you just feel helpless, and I think probably this was kind of the way they were. Well, chapter two, we get introduced to Boaz right off the bat. I think this is interesting. Look at verse one. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. Now, isn't that interesting? That first verse, they're going to introduce Boaz before we get any further with the story. And I think that's kind of interesting that God would do that. There's a reason, I think, behind it. First of all, we see he's a kinsman of Elimelech. He is a, the kinsman redeemer, and that means he's a type of Christ. He's a type of Jesus. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. And as we put the story together, you're going to see this. It's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful picture of Christ. He's also a type of grace. We're going to see he, the, he's the second kinsman, 
And the first kinsman wasn't able to provide for Ruth. That's the law. The law can't provide, so the kinsman redeemer, Boaz, steps in. And we're going to see all that. There, we're not going to do that tonight. It's just that's coming. So you understand a little bit about that. Now, it says he was a mighty man of wealth. Interesting that they would note that, being that they are so poor. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, are they taking notice of uh, possible uh, donors, uh, people that they could count on as family to help them? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure this has anything to do. I, it has to do, well, let's just go on. He was a mighty man of wealth. That's material wealth. I'm going to tell you something else as we're going to find out. He's a man of faith. He stayed when the famine came. He's a man of faith, and God blessed him for that. He's a man of integrity. He's a man of his word. He doesn't violate the law. We're going to find that out about him. He's a man of generosity. You're going to find that he's very generous, and he takes care of his workers, and he takes care of these poor that are there gleaning from his field. He's a man uh, who found favor with other men. We'll read in just a second about his... Uh, the other men that are around him, and when he has to deal with the men at the gate, they understand him. There's an acceptance of who he is. And he will be the great-grandfather of David. And that's an important part of the lineage of Christ. There's Boaz, Obed is their son, Jesse's his son, and David is Jesse's son. He's the great-grandfather of David. Well, why is that important? Because David's line is the line of Christ. So this sets up the line of Christ right here. Now, I think he's introduced here because of the important role that he plays in that story of Ruth. He is a major character, and we're going to see that as we get further into it. Chapter, verse 2, and Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, go my daughter. Now, let me teach you a little bit about the law of gleaning, gleaning, Go in your Bibles, go to Leviticus chapter 19, look at verses 9 and 10 through 10. And we're going to read where God provides. This is God's welfare program. This is the way God said they were to take care of those who were widows, the poor, the ones that didn't have any income, didn't have anybody to take care of. This is how they could take care of themselves. And it's a great law. It's perfect. I mean, it really fits well. Leviticus 19 verse 9. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of the field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. So you've got a square field down here, and it's all full of grain. When they go in there to harvest, they're to leave the corners. They round the corners off, so there's grain standing there. And then as they go through, they go through one harvest. They go through and they glean all they can out of that. And um, they said with man power, gleaning, there was about 30% of the, the harvest that was left on the ground. I mean, they, they drop it or it didn't get all done, and they cleaned it up. Now, today it wouldn't work so well because we have machines now that 99.9%, .9%, I mean, they don't leave anything. They, they vacuum as they're coming along behind it to make sure they don't leave anything. But in this day and time, it was a great way. 30% of, of their harvest was be left for those that had need. Now, verse, verse 10 goes on, And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Now, it's interesting because he says the poor and the stranger. Well, we're going to find out who these strangers are. Go to Deuteronomy 24, and we find it there again. Uh, Deuteronomy 24, verse 19 through 21. Deuteronomy 24, 19 through 21. <coughs> 24, 19. When thou cuttest down thy harvest in thy field, and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be there for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thy hands. When thou hast thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and the widow. So you see God leaves these uh, fruits, he leaves these grains, he leaves these, these for those who are needed. And he mentions the widows, the fatherless, and the strangers. Well, who are the strangers? Yeah, it'd be Moabite people. What do you love? Strange to us, I'm sorry. Strange to us is they just go in your land 
Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. It, well, it was, it was their way of taking care of each other. It's a wonderful system, too, when you think about it. This is a welfare system where I have left food in my, in my yard for you. If you want it, come and pick it yourself. Amen? You get it? I love that. They still had to work for it. Ruth had to work hard. She goes out there gleaning. She doesn't get to go through and take it, take it right off the stock. She had to pick up what was on the ground. and she had, It was not easy what she did. It was work, but it provided for those in need. Great system. Boy, don't you wish the United States would learn that system. Amen? Uh, that's the way it ought to be. And this is, what, this is the way God established that system. Now, how will she know where to glean? Now, this is a question that's real important. Ruth Needs to know where to glean. Now think about it. She's a Moabitess, and it's obvious. There's, there's an obvious, she's, she's different than everybody else. She's not an Israeli. She's not Jewish. Uh, she's a Moabite. And so there's a physical difference. And uh, she goes out to glean in the field, and she's coming along. And it could be that somebody owns the property says, no, I'm sorry, you're a Moabite. I, you, you can't. Uh, only, this is for the Jewish people. This is not for you. Now, they wouldn't be living by what's in the Word of God because it said for the stranger. But there could be those that have that kind of bigotry and said, no, you can't. And so she could suffer trying to find a spot to glean, to be able to pick up. And uh, so I asked that question, where, where is she going to glean? Glean the ears of corn after him. Now, listen to what she said. After him in whose sight I shall find grace. So she's counting on those, wherever she goes, she's counting on God to provide somebody that will allow her to come in there and glean the field. And she does ask, even we're going to see this on Boaz's field, she asks if she can come in there and glean. Now, note, she's not sure where, just where someone will let her, basically. It may not seem important to her, but it is important to the shepherds and the wise men who come to find a baby in Bethlehem. Because if she doesn't find Boaz's field, Boaz doesn't find her. There's no Obed. There's no Jesse. There's no David. Are you with me? she got to go to the right field. Now, if you or I were there, we might want to go, I know what's supposed to happen, so you follow me. You, I'm going to take you down. I'm going to introduce you to Boaz because you need to make sure that you meet Boaz. Y'all watch, um, how many of you watch Back to the Future? I love that movie. The first time I watched it, I went, you're going, what, what, what? Well, I've watched it several times. Remember how he's trying to make sure his, his mom and dad get together? Well, this would be what we would do if we were in these shoes. We'd try, Ruth, you need to come with us. Come, we need you to meet Boaz, because if you don't meet Boaz, we've got a problem. You know, Jesus won't make it. I mean, we've got, we've got to have you get to where you are so Jesus will be where he is. We, we, she doesn't know what's going on. Do you know what her concern is? To eat. To eat. That's all her concern. I'm just going to go find a place where I can. She doesn't have any idea that she's part of this massive plan of God, and I think it's awesome. And if she chooses the wrong field, we've got a problem. She needs to get it right. Amen? Does she realize how important this choice is? No. She is just trying to feed herself. We're about to witness the sovereignty of God in action. I mean, we're about to witness it right here in these pages. We're going to see the sovereignty of God like it's unbelievable. Verse 3. She went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her half was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was the kindred of Elimelech. How did Ruth determine which field to go to? There had been many. Now think about this. Bethlehem's up on a hill. If you ever get to go there, you'll see it. It's up on a hill, and like where the shepherds had their sheep. It's off the hill, down. And the, the land off the hill is just fertile as it can be. I mean, all the way around it. And you can imagine there were fields everywhere. People owned the land, and they were they was packed with all kinds of, of uh, grains and everything. And it was just packed. She could have gone anyway. She could have gone south. She could have gone north. She could have gone west. I mean, she, any which way she went, she'd have found a field somewhere down the road. But she goes to this field, and she starts there, and she starts to glean. Uh, she is, um, let me see where I'm at. Uh, yeah, but Ruth was an outsider, an obvious threat to others. Now, have you ever thought about this? See, I'm, I'm a Texan. I don't know about you. I, I don't much, I'm not really in favor of these people coming from these other states to my state and taking advantage of all the things I've got here in Texas. Amen? 
And I think if I were an Israelite, if I were a Jew, and I was a Jewish widow who counted on these crops, these things for my good, and I see an outsider coming in, I might go over and kind of shove her on back out of the way. Amen? She, she probably had a hard time fitting in. How does she wind up in the right field? It says her hap, H-A-P, her hap, if you have a King James, was to light on a part of the field belonging to Boaz. Does anybody have a different translation that says something other than hap? Happens, yeah, happens or perhaps. I like what um, J. Vernon McGee says. It would be what we call a happenstance, amen, a happenstance. It just happened that way. That she would light on a part of it. It just seemed like it just happened. It just no, no real purpose. Just, it just happened that way. Well, I tell you what. Let's just call that happenstance. Let's just call that the sovereignty of God. Amen? Let's just say that's just God doing what God does. And we don't have any ability to understand how he does it. But he just does it. She found the middle of God's will by hap. By happenstance. Most of us think we must find God's will by some supernatural occurrence in our lives. When I was in school, many of the guys were praying about where to go. They were starting churches or pastoring, and they were praying, I want to be in God's will. Oh, God, tell me your will. I just need to know. Give me a sign. Give me a sign. And they were looking for signs in the sky. They were looking for signs in every place, you know. And uh, <clears throat> I, I just have to tell you that uh, I don't know if any of you had a road to Damascus experience to find God's will, or if you've uh, ever uh, had him, him speak to you like he spoke to Jonah, or, or maybe you were riding your donkey and the donkey stopped, turned around, and started talking to you. If you've never had that happen, you may be questioning, how do I know God's will? How do you know God's will? You know? And you wonder sometimes, well, how do you know God's will? How can you be sure of God's will? Or this situation with the camp meeting, I mean, how do we know that's God's will? How do we know that? I'm going to give you five areas of Scripture of what we do know is God's will. And this is important because if we go to the Scriptures and say the will of God, according to the Word of God, the will of God is this, then I know if I'm doing that, I'm in the will of God, okay? So I'm going to give you five areas from Scripture where we know we're in the will of God. Number one, we know it's the will of God for you to be saved. 2 Peter 3.9. 2 Peter 3.9. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. His will is not to be lost, but his will is to be saved. So if you're saved, you know you're in the middle of God's will because you're saved. Amen? There you go. There's number one. According to God's word, if you're saved, you're in the middle of God's word. You're in the middle of God's will. Secondly... You're in the middle of God's will if you're spirit-filled. Ephesians 5, 17 and 18. Ephesians 5, 17 and 18. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, where is excess, but filled with the Spirit. So I know the will of God is for me to be spirit-filled. Now, that's an, there's an action to that, just like there is to be saved. To be saved, you have to make a choice. To be spirit-filled, you have to make a choice. I've told you that when you get saved, you've got all the spirit you'll ever have. The problem is he just doesn't have all of you. And the more you give to him, the more you yield yourself to him, the more he has of you, the more spirit-filled you are. And if you are spirit-filled, then you are in the will of God. So you're saved, spirit-filled. Let's go on. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 7. It's God's will for us to be sanctified. For this is the will of God. There it is. What is? Even your sanctification. That you should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. You ought to know how to live for God. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also are forewarned, you are testi you and testified. For God hath not called us to uncleanness, but to holiness. We're to be sanctified. That's holiness. That's living the godly life. That's an action for us, isn't it? That's something we work on. That's something we let God do through us. That's how we get sanctified. We're saved because he saved us. We're spirit-filled because he fills us. We're sanctified because he sanctifies us. Number four, it's the will of God for us to be submissive. 
1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 through 15. 1 Peter 2, 13 through 15. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be the king as supreme or the governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. The will of God is for us to be submissive to those in authority, those in leadership. But that's something we have to work on, isn't it? It's God doing that through us, though. That's how that works. Every one of those, salvation comes as he provides salvation for us. Uh, spirit filledness comes as we yield ourselves and he then fills us. He's the one that does the filling. We are sanctified when we yield ourselves to him and we yield our, our flesh to him so that then he can sanctify us and make us holy. We're submissive in the fact that God uh, takes us and moves us from areas of non-submission, and that would be disobedience or rebellion, to submission. And that's important because that's the will of God. I've got one more. and It's kind of a hidden will of God, but I think you'll understand it. It's the will of God for us to suffer. 1 Peter 5.10 says this, 1 Peter 5.10 but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after that you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. This is God's will for us to suffer. Because in suffering, he builds us, he grows us, he makes us who we're supposed to be. So let's think about these five things. If I'm saved, I'm spirit-filled. I'm living the way God wants me to live. I'm submissive to his his authority and i'm willing to go through the suffering to do whatever he asked me to do do you know what i can do anything i want to and i will be in the will of god think about it so, no you wouldn't yes i will how can i not be if i'm spirit filled how can i not be if i'm not obedient and submissive to him how can i not be in his will sure if those five things are working in my life do what you want to because you'll want to do what god wants you to do i'm telling you it won't change. It's not about you going, oh, good, now I can go sin. No, you can't either. You're spirit-filled. You're sanctified. You can't do that. So this is part of being the will of God. I think for, for Ruth, I think what we see is exactly that. Had, Ruth was not working at finding the will of God. She was living the will of God, and God puts her in the middle of his will. There she is, standing out in the middle of this field, with a bunch of people she, could, she doesn't even know. I'm not sure she can communicate with them. And she's standing there, either liked or disliked, but she's standing in the middle of God's will right there. And she doesn't even know it. Isn't that amazing? I think that's awesome. So here we are. Enter Boaz, verse 4. Late to the party, but being owner, that's okay. He says, verse 4, And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, they're already working, by the way, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Man, what a great place to work. Amen. Wouldn't you love to work at a place like that? Where the owner shows up and said, God be with you. Peace be with you. That would be awesome to have that kind of relationship with the owner. And this is who he was. This is the kind of man he was. He was, he, was, he was liked by those who worked for him. And I think we understand why. Because he took care of them. Verse 5. Here's what I wrote. Uh-oh. He spots Ruth. Right? Verse 5. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Who's the dam who is, Whose damsel is this? Now, I have a Newton translation for you. All right? va 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 boom who is that good looker over there? And is she single? That's what he's asking. Are you with me? That's what he's asking. Who does she belong to? He wants to know if she has anybody that she's tied. I want to know if she's single. He's a very eligible bachelor, by the way. Probably has been sought after by every mother of every single woman in town, you know. I bet he's eaten more meals, you know. And put up with all the stuff. And he just can't seem to find that right one. And all of a sudden, he sees Ruth. And can I tell you something? It was love at first sight. He loved her at first sight. You know why I know that? Because Jesus Christ loved you at first sight. He loves me at first sight. And if he's the type of Christ, it's just never been that he hadn't loved us. Amen. And he loves us. 
We're witnessing that thing called love at first sight. Verse 6, and the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, surely no one you would be interested in, basically. He said, uh, it's the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country. Of Mo- it's a Moabite. She's a Moabite. You probably wouldn't be interested in her. Uh, verse 7, he goes on, and she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. So she wasn't just good looking. She was a hard worker. That's what he says. That's, that's what Boaz hears, you know. Now, I think the servant is trying to say, well, uh, almost apologize. Well, I, you know, she came and needed some help, and I helped her. I, I don't know what to tell you. You know, I probably shouldn't have done it. She's a Moabite. But he's probably thinking he's going to be in trouble. He's not because this is exactly what Boaz wants to hear. And like I said, all the mothers. Look, and I think she's a hard worker. And I'll tell you what I thought of. I thought of Proverbs 31, ladies. When I, when I hear this about her, when I think about her out there in that field and working to try to take care of Naomi, I think of her heart attitude. I think of her de- de- determination to be a blessing to, to Naomi and, and to take care of things and to work so hard. And I thought of Proverbs 31, and here's the verses I thought of, verse 13. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. That's, that's Ruth. She's like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. That's, that's Ruth. She rises also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and the portion of her handmaidens. She considereth the field to abide, and with the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. Doesn't that sound like Ruth? It's just Ruth all over. Proverbs 31. That's who she is. She's everything that Boaz has been looking for. And uh, he's excited. Verse 8. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, oh, now, it gets, it gets nice. We're moving from communicating through the servant to actually communicating face to face. And uh, do you guys remember the first time you talked to your wife, uh, asked him out on a date? I, I, I remember because I was scared to death. I don't know why, but I was. I was good looking as I was. There's no way she could say no. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Yes, right. If she were here, she would second that, though. But it took, me, it took me two months to get up the courage to ask her, you know. Boaz, he's in love, I mean, from the sight of her. This is nothing for him. And he wants to let her know, I'm after you. I, I know it's not what he says, but I think it's in between the lines. Let's listen. Boaz said to Ruth, Harvest thou not, my daughter, or hearest thou not, my daughter, Go not to the glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Now, it's interesting to me, he doesn't say, don't harvest, I'll take care, I'll give you what you need. He says, you continue to harvest here. He wants to keep her nearby. He wants her to keep coming and taking care of herself and taking care of Naomi the way she was. I thought that was kind of interesting. Verse 9, let thine eyes be on the field that that they do reap, and go go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Oh, man, I'm telling you, this is, this is love oozing out all over. I'm telling you what, this is him batting his eyes going, please, just please. I mean, he's in love with this woman. He's, I, I know we don't, he's, he's not saying it yet, but I'm telling you, the guy is overboard. Don't go anywhere else. Come right here. Why? Well, if I was honest, I just want to make sure I get to see you every day. Amen? And then don't, I want you to stay right here in the fields, and you follow behind us. And I've, to, I've already told, already, I mean already, he's gone down there and told the men, you don't touch her. You leave her alone. Now, whether he said that's mine, I don't know, but he told him to leave her alone. And that, you know, that had to be comforting to her because she was beautiful. Her name means beautiful. She was beautiful. And I'm sure she had wolf whistles and people saying derogatory things to her all the time. But immediately when he told those men, it stopped. Don't you know she appreciated that? Boy, I tell you, he's in love with her. And then he says, if you get thirsty, I don't want you to have to go draw water. I've told the men, make sure and have some there for you. Anytime you need it, you just go there. And I guarantee he told them, if if she shows up and there's not any, y'all run it over there and you make sure and pull that water up for her. I don't want to see her pulling on that, that drawstring to get that water out of there. She shouldn't have to. You take care of her. I mean, he's in love with Ruth, and uh, he wants to be her benefactor. Now, 
Like I said, Boaz is a type of Christ, and we'll see that in him. This is the way God wants, this is the way Christ wants to have a relationship with us, isn't it? You know, in the funeral uh, yesterday, uh, when I do a funeral, many times because the crowds are not always church people, uh, and I understand that I've got people there that if I, if I walk in in my three-piece suit and I pull my Bible out and throw it out, they just shut down. They just shut down. You had been so proud of me yesterday. I didn't even wear a tie to this funeral. I mean, I wore blue jeans. Can you believe that? To a funeral. I apologized to the little girl when I got there. I said, I normally wear a suit. I'm sorry, but I just felt like you're dead. This is his lifestyle. I think this is more important. She said, oh, you're going to fit right in. I said, good, because I want them to hear what I had to say. But so many people have this idea that God's a killjoy. They, they think, if I, if I serve God, if I become a churchgoer, Bible thumper, I'll never have any fun the rest of my life. And they just don't, that's exactly right. They just do not understand the joy that comes from living with Christ. And I shared with them, I said, do you, do you realize what happens when you start living for Jesus? I said, you have purpose, and you're fulfilling that purpose. There is a, there's a fulfillment there like you never have any place else. It's an amazing lifestyle. It's unbelievable. And I told him, I said, you need to understand something. God who created you, the only desire he has is to have a relationship with you. That's it. That's all he thinks about. You're on his mind all day long because he wants that relationship. And he strives for it. Every chance he gets, he tries to, he tries to get in there and get that relationship going. He's always there. He's wanting that. If only we had the desire that he had for that relationship, what a difference it would make. And we see this in Ruth and Boaz. We see Boaz, he's going to make this relationship work. He wants this relationship. He's letting her know, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to be here for you. I'm going to, I'm going to watch over you. I'm going to be here. And God tells us that. He wants to be our provider, our protector. Psalm 23 is the perfect illustration of who God is and what he can do for us. And he wants to be all of that for us. But the only reason he can't is because we push him away. And that's the only thing that keeps him from it. As we study the book of Ruth, I hope that we'll consider this love relationship as it pictures our relationship with God. Amen? Any question, comment, or thought? And I've got a microphone, so if you have one, please let him get to you before you ask. Anybody? All right. Carson has something he wants to interject. He's coming. Just hang on. Mm -hmm. They were having the barley harvest. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that during the barley harvest, everybody was so busy out in the fields that there was less people in town, so a little bit easier to get into town if you were the stranger coming to town? Probably. I mean, there was a lot of things that were happening. It was, a, it was an exciting time. Remember, this is probably the first harvest they've had since the famine, as we think. There's a possibility. And so people are excited. And the fields are full. The fields are just packed. And so everybody's excited because it's going to be a great harvest. Everybody's going to get to take some food home. And, uh, and I think the poor were excited, too, because of the gleaning process. They were going to have plenty, and uh, it was going to be great. But you could have some people that were stingy and said, hey, you're from Moab. Go on. Go back to Moab and see if you can glean there, you know. See if they let you glean there. But, yeah, it was a great time to be there. Somebody else? Barley was the grain of the poor, uh, Hayward says. Garlic. So it's a good place to be. And they could do everything with that. You know, flour, wheat, they, they could just, man, they could make bread, and all kinds of things. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what you said about them being able to glean, that's not, that's not giving them charity. They had to work for yeah, it. Yeah, they had to work for it. Nowadays, everybody wants charity. Yeah, they give me, give me, give me. Let them work for it and then help them out. Yeah, there was no entitlement. They knew they could. But even see Ruth, even though the law provided for her, according to God's law, provided that she could go in that field, she asked before she did. And I think that's the way it worked. They always ask before they, they wouldn't just go into the field and say, I demand that you let me clean the corners. No, no, you ain't going to do it because they still own the land. Patty has a question. Oh, it is a question. Yep. Jess, uh, Josette, she's waiting on you. Yep. Mine's a comment and a question. I think Ruth 
it never occurred to Ruth not to go with her. The, the way I read it, she was bonded to her mother-in-law, which mm -hmm. is kind of unusual mm -hmm. from our point of view. Um, and it really hit me when you were talking about that because when my husband, my first husband was diagnosed terminal, of course I had to blurt it out to everybody at work to explain why I was so upset. And I wasn't gonna tell him, but it came out anyway. And one of the young men who had heard about it, didn't work in my department, came up to me, and he was young. And he wanted to know the whole story, so I told him, and he looked at me in all honesty and innocence and says, well, why don't you just leave him? Mm. I can't tell you mm. how hard that knife went in. Mm. But I think that's where Ruth was mm -hmm. when Naomi was trying to tell her it was she okay go to back. go home. Mm -hmm. I don't think she could do it any mm. more than I could have. Yeah, probably not. Don't know, but I, 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 there's a reason she followed, and it's not because she was going to be well received. Just said. Anybody else have a question? Comment? Thought. You're thoughtless tonight. Okay. Amen. We'll take a praise. Let her have it. You know, listening to you talk about Boaz and his love for her when he first saw her, I can honestly say that was my husband. Amen. You no, know, it's a beautiful thing. It is. I, well, I love to tell the love stories of the Bible because they relate. Amen? Amen. All right, anybody else? All right, we're uh, down to uh, another, another week, and we're in our first week of March, right? First week of March? Yeah. Three, three day what? Three days in, my watch. I, read, I said it, and I said it wrong. It says fourth. I've got it. Tomorrow's Monday, yeah. March 4th, John Sousa Day. John Philip Sousa Day, March 4th. 4th, yeah, I got the, yeah. <laughs> Patty told a funny. All right. All right, well, praise the Lord. Let's have a good week. Let's keep a good spirit. Y'all pray about our situation in Trinity, that God works that, God's going to work that out. And uh, it's going to be exciting as we, we go over there. We're going to reach a bunch of people we've never reached before. That town's going to get to see our churches come together and work and it's going to be an amazing thing, I think. And the more I've thought about it, the more I see God's hand on it. And I, I'm just, now if God says, no, it's not what I wanted, he pulls that out from underneath me. At least now I know not to get mad. I just say, okay, God, you just tell me and I'll go wherever you tell me. That's all I know to do. Amen? Let's stand and be dismissed the word of prayer. Amen. Thank you for being here. And um, next Sunday, Brother Kyle will be back with you because Ruby and I will be gone on vacation. It seems like we just here lately, we just can't seem to stay at home, so... What that's all about but anyway y'all have a good time let's pray father lord i thank you for the day i thank you for your many blessings i thank you for our church our church family father the joy that we i know i have when we get together and i, th I think lord we all tend to have that same kind of joy there's a peace there's a comfort there's a there's a laughter there's a undercurring joy that just takes over and, and we just love being together and thank you god for making us that kind of a people thank you lord for all that you've done today and we pray, Father, you'll go with us, watch over us as we go our different directions, and bring us back safely at your calling. In Jesus' name, amen.